Hi everyone, we're going to get started on the February 22nd school committee meeting. I'm not crying today. We had a party at work. I had a lot of pink eyeshadow on and my eyes really hurt from wearing pink eyeshadow. I should not wear eyeshadow. It's just really Is that for the notes? Second it. Yes, thank you. Is there a motion? I am not crying. Um, so, approval of minutes for January 25th, please. I'm sorry, Humera's running late, Heather's out of town on business, and Humera's running late. She'll be here in a little while. Now, minutes. Motion to, I didn't have any comments. Motion to approve the minutes from January 25th. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Adjustments to the agenda, what do we have to do? So I want to ask the CPAC, I believe they'd like to wait until they have more of their membership present. So yes. you all can just signal to us when okay. you're ready to do your presentation, if that's okay with We have two more members that will be presenting and just a couple more members that would like to be present. Sure. Sure. And that was it. Okay. Um, public comment period, I think not. We will move on. Jenny. Jenny what? <laughs> Jenny's not that part of the public comment period. She's part of the school committee now. Oh, yeah. She's with us now. <laughs> For better or worse. For better or worse, right. Okay, so we're waiting on that program of studies. Mr. Beck. It's m much less substantial than last year. I'm not making a massive change to anything uh, in the program of studies. <clears throat> there were a couple logistical changes. Um, there was one find where students, it still reflected that students were expected to carry 40 credits rather than 35. Uh, so we're just making that adjustment because students carry seven courses rather than eight. Um, and we addressed the terminology that's used. The old programs of studies over the last several years used terminology level one, level two, uh, and honors and advanced placement, but that terminology was inconsistent with what we report when we report to the Department of Education. Um, we report slightly different numbers to the Department of Education and it makes it cleaner for our student information system, but also for students in the registration process if we just use the language of it's a college prep course, um, an honors course, an advanced placement course, and if it doesn't have anything assigned to it like physical education, it's unleveled and doesn't count toward the GPA. So nothing is changing with that with regard to the algorithms that are being used to calculate GPA. All the courses remain the same, but we're just changing the language for the program of studies exclusively to make it consistent and easier for kids to understand because they don't have to go back and, and check what level they're at. Um, and then uh, in the English department, there are two new courses that are proposed as electives. We, over the last couple of years, have had a pretty significant number of students who have taken both creative writing as well as um, film drama and literature, uh, or some combination of those courses. And what we wanted to be able to do was not remove those from the program of studies. Those can still be integrated at some point in the future, but offered uh, two new courses that are focused primarily on um, communication skills, marketing, promotions, especially going into a year where uh, the year after we'll be hosting an accreditation visitation team and it provides us the opportunity to have students really put together many of the presentations and lead those presentations when the visiting committees come in. Um, we're hopeful that we'll have an opportunity to get ourselves a camera uh, to be able to do some film work with the students, um, but some of the, these courses will also involve uh, writing outreach into the community. Um, much more of an extension of what's done with the yearbook students in terms of uh, reaching out to the community to try to gain community support or uh, to just provide information to the community about the school. Basically, we, we want students to take the lead in, in um, providing public relations opportunities for the school because frankly, I think there are some great things going on here and they all revolve around the talent of our kids. and. You know, who better to show that off than our actual students. So in addition to the fact that it provides both of these courses, we'll provide them with uh, a lower stress uh, opportunity to be able to get involved with um, media, media relations, marketing, public relations, and other uh, skills that will be very important for them later on down the road. In the social studies department, there is one new course that we're proposing to add. Uh, it's an honors level course. 
and addresses that thing that all of us feel as history teachers that we do. Um, we get caught up in coverage, and when we get to the point where we've done the Cold War and we get up into maybe touch on Vietnam, but we don't get too much into the modern world. And so this is an honors course, a five credit course that will, will be open to everybody. Um, and by the way, opening that stuff up worked out really well this year, including moving uh, the AP U.S. history to, uh, down to sophomores because our advanced placement enrollment went from 66 to 112, so we almost doubled our enrollment in, in advanced placement courses uh, with the faculty making those adjustments. So this will be a course that will be open to everybody in grades 11 and 12. Um, and basically covers the modern world in a, um, from 1950 forward, so just post-World War II forward into the modern world and doing it in, in a little bit more of a thematic context, looking at it in the context of things like genocide, um, global economic changes and crises and things like that, looking at energy markets, uh, but really looking at it in a way that we often do, don't do at the high school level because we're, you know, we're so bent on um, covering the earlier aspects of history. And it leaves students really un underprepared, I think, to um, be able to effectively vote, think, be taxpayers, participate in the community if they don't have that global context. Um, and then the last change is both for high school and for middle school. It's the only uh, recommended change for the middle school. Um, and you'll see that's on the last page of the summary that the middle school, the seventh and eighth grade science curricula topics change fairly drastically along with sixth grade. And over the course of the last two years, Jess Plourd, um has worked with, uh, from the elementary school, has worked with Susan Duncan and um, Kathy Nigella to uh, basically prepare to move to the National Science Curriculum. So these were prepared last year, but you may remember we did not move to approve them. Uh, because the curriculum had not yet been approved. Now that it's been approved and accepted, we feel like we're in good shape to be able to move forward with these course descriptions. And they're in the process of rewriting the curriculum for grades seven and eight for next year. In each of the high school courses, the changes are far, uh, far less substantial. There's an addition or uh, extraction of a topic here or there in each of the courses. But largely, for example, physics and advanced physics stay relatively the same but there are some minor changes to some of the other courses. Um, the advanced placement curricula uh, for those courses remains the same too because that's dictated by the college board. So those are just some changes in topics rather than wholesale changes to the curriculum. So it's relatively minor, although there's four pages worth of science stuff in here. So, any I don't, questions? I, I don't totally get the systems and cycles class. What is that <coughs> class going to be in seventh grade? Um, <clears throat> Basically, bio biological systems, environmental systems, and studying um, it, 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 the, the course itself had primarily been focused on biological sciences over the last several years, and the eighth grade predominantly took on the physical sciences. Yep. And they've made some minor changes so that there's duplication of topics, but with an increased level of sophistication uh, commensurate with each grade. This is a wholesale shift in the curriculum, and the National Science Curriculum seeks to have both of those uh, courses rather than having them be sort of like discrete courses, like the idea of moving from physics in grade 9 to biology in grade 10, which are very discrete uh, courses. This in, it's more integrated. So in the seventh grade, it primarily focuses on similar phenomena to the eighth grade, <clears throat> but in the context of um, the refurbishing cycles in, uh, of, of basically the circle of life, so to speak, but uh, through weather systems and environmental structures and, and the impact of man on the environment and so forth. So. Thank you. And <coughs> one of the things that happened with the next generation science standards is there's less of an emphasis on having subject matter discrete and compartmentalized and separated, and there's an emphasis now on what they refer to as the scientific practices and ways of thinking. And so to Mr. Beck's point, that you'll see what they refer to as spiraling. So you revisit some of the same content over and over again in multiple grades in order to develop these scientific practices or ways of thinking, which are inquiry using the scientific method. And so something like cycles is a concept that they want students to be really well versed in instead of just learning biology or a discrete subject matter in that particular grade. 
and it hopefully will work out, uh, although we've done well on the eighth grade science test, hopefully it will work out better as the tests are adjusted too because our kids get the concepts reinforced and we'll hopefully be better prepared for secondary um, science and you know, ultimately we end up with more students enrolled in AP chemistry and uh, AP biology and hopefully uh, instead of an advanced physics course can begin an, an, an AP physics course in the future. We just did the Hopkins program to study. We didn't wait for you. I read the whole thing. Uh, any other questions? Do you guys want to, while you're standing and Jenny's here, is the new schedule going well? Are you happy with it? I'd rather hear a student's perspective because we're <laughs> going to be putting out the survey to kids that was developed by school council soon to be able to give feedback before um, we actually go through scheduling. We'll begin the registration process shortly after the program of studies is um, put together, but that will guide. If we have to make any changes, we can come back in March um, and propose those changes to the program of studies, and that gives us the opportunity to get feedback from students uh, on a survey that's developed by the school council. But uh, Jenny's been in, had been in the old schedule for Actually, we went through middle school here for two years, yeah. and then three years in the alternating block schedule. So, I mean, your perspective is probably yeah. I more. I actually really like the new schedule. I was initially very much opposed to it, and but then um, once once I got used to it, and once the transitioning period had passed, I actually liked it a lot better um, because I liked that the same class would be at different times during the day over the course of one week. Um, one thing that I didn't like about um, the old schedule was that you'd have the same class, it would either like always be in the morning and always be in the afternoon, which could be great or it could be not so great if you have a test and it's early in the morning. So I really like, um, I really like that with this new schedule, the same class can be at different times during the day. And I think for me personally, it's worked a lot better. I really like it. Thanks. Yeah, I think, kid, the, I think the kids were great <coughs> as it were into the first month of school and beginning to ask questions. And we get a lot of, um, give me a little bit more time. I haven't quite made the adjustment yet. We've only gone through you know, one full cycle of the 10 days. And then as we followed up, they began to make adjustments and began to talk to each other. So I'll be curious to find out as we get toward the end of the year too, what recommendations do you have for middle school kids now coming up in this schedule? How do they have to adapt their executive functioning skills and their planning to be able to, to, to do better in this schedule? Now that they're they're acquainted with it because their schedule's the same going through from seventh and eighth grade, it's just the subject matter becomes much more challenging. Right. So. And I think we need an action item to mm -hmm. accept the program of studies. Which means so moved. Thank you, Roby. Second it. All in favor of that? Aye. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Beck. Do you have all your people here? We are all and here. I just want to double check, Mr. Desjardins, when we moved, I'm assuming you're using the laptop that we have set up here for the presentation. Was there a, did you bring a laptop? We brought both. Either way is fine. Okay, so however you prefer. You did, um, you have a thumb drive. Do you have a thumb drive? Yep. Do you mind if, is that just yours or is that the one that? No, it's fine. They can use it. It's just the same. Or if you have a computer and you just pull it up, that's fine yeah. too. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. So, Chris, he's good. He's at <coughs> oh. And if you'd like, while you're setting it up, we can look at the calendar. I was just going to say, yeah. yeah. Is that okay? So then, when you have your inevitable AV problems, we you won't see that. We'll be doing other things. <laughs> Not that you. <laughs> just an extra. So, the school calendar. What do you need to tell us about it? So our process for putting this together is a conversation with our administrative team and uh, with the town um, because we want to, on election days, the town, it's much easier for the town if we're not open on those days or if we use those days as curriculum days. And we met with the labor union. And here were the recommendations that teachers would return on August 29th and 30th for two of their PD days professional development days. Students would then return on August 31st, having something that the faculty seemed to like and felt as though students liked a staggered start of three days, four days, five days to lead into the school year. The parent conferences are split up this year intentionally. So Hopkins parent conferences 
are um, about midway through that first quarter. The elementary conferences are later. Those aren't days off, they're just conference days. And that's because the elementary collects a lot of formative assessment data and wants time to pull that together before having parent conferences. We've identified where marking periods end. We'd have a curriculum day on November 8th, um, Veterans Day. In discussions with labor, and there are other districts, I believe Hatfield's one of them and a couple of others, East Hampton, who are recommending closing uh, Wednesday, November 23rd for the entire day, um, that day. And Why? Um, That's new. So the recommendation, this was, this was an idea that was floated up by uh, labor, and some of the advantages to that are uh, there's a limit for the, the contracts as to how many people can have that day off. There are a lot of people that it's e much easier for them to travel one day before that Wednesday in terms of just easier for them to travel. Our um, attendance is, like most schools, sometimes it's not the greatest day for school attendance that Wednesday half day. And so again, there are other districts. I know Hatfield and I believe East Hampton and a few others from us with the superintendents who are also looking to um, close school entirely on Wednesday, the 23rd. The other recommendation was similarly to start the break on the Friday, uh, the 23rd, rather than having a half day there, have a full day off. Have a full day of school December 22nd, Thursday, and a, then vacation just begins Friday, the 23rd. Um, school would reopen after the New Year holiday. And our next curriculum day is April 11th, which is a town election day. And assuming um, no snow days, students get out June 15th, faculty would have a final administrative day on June 16th. Does not having those two half days mean that instead of getting out on the 14th, or, uh, potentially that's a day longer of school? Because you need to make up two half days no, this, with one this has, day? So this 15th, June 15th, that assumes no snow, which yeah, yeah. is going to happen. But, Assuming no snow, June 15th is the 180th day for students with all the days off you see here. If you created two half days there, then the final day for students would be June 13th. Okay. So my only concern with the 23rd and the, the well, the 23rd, 23rd and both the 23rd both days <laughs> is uh, just thinking about parents and, and who don't always get that off, right? Sure. To take that off. Typically, those would be half days. Is that how it's been? They could, yes. Always, Wednesday's always been a half day, and I think prior to winter break. Um, I think it was always half days. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. The downside is, like you say, there's not much attendance, and mm -hmm. it's probably not a very productive educational day. And keep in mind, from the perspective of a process, we come together, we make a recommendation to the school committee, the school committee votes the calendar. So we can certainly make any revisions that the school committee thinks make sense. I think it would be interesting to go back and look at attendance on on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving and the day before the Christmas sure. half day this year and then compare next year because if all it does is move us that more families are taking the day before off, then I'm not sure we've gained anything. Mm -hmm. Did I state that at all clearly? Mm -hmm. I knew what I was trying to say. <laughs> It's the eyeliner. But it would be good to note, if, if we go with this, it would be good to see what the impact is next year. Mm -hmm. I like your pink pen. Sure. Anyone have concerns with this? No. Okay. Motion to accept. Motion to approve this calendar. Thank you. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. You didn't have any technical difficulties at all. Nicely done. <laughs> Come on up, whoever is giving us the presentation, please. Okay, well, you're going to be hearing from four of our group. I know many of you, but for those of you who don't know, I'm Jen Label. I'm up here in the district. I have um, two stepsons, and I have two little boys also. Um, so I first want to say thank you for having us today. Um, as you know from our packet, and you probably knew beforehand, the CPAC is supposed to advise the school committee. That is one role that we have. Um, 
and we are supposed to advise you on matters that pertain to the education and safety of students with special needs. It makes a lot of sense. So our vision with this survey was to do just that and to also represent the voice of parents in our district. Um, we wanted to look into um, what could have been written off as rumors, just people talking within our community, giving feedback to one another. Um, and we wanted to really systematically see what the true opinions were. Um, and so the idea of this survey was born. Um, I am very proud to be here because this was an amazing process for our CPAC. Um, it brought a group of parents very close together. So I'm, I'm really proud of our work. And before we get into the meat of this, I want to say a few thank yous. Um, I want to say thank you to Pat, she's sitting behind me, um, Pat Bell, um, for being present at our meetings and for her support. Um, also to Ann, Ann McKenzie um, for your support as well, Annie, and for helping us administer the survey. And Heather's not here, but she also advised us, so I want to say thanks for her expertise. There were a lot of people um, that had a role in helping make this happen, both within our group and in the district. And a couple more thank yous um, to Corey Feltovic, uh, Nada, and to Mr. Duffy as well. So many people were very helpful with this. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce the other members of our group, so if you will raise your hand. Um, Julie O'Leary, part of our subcommittee. Hello. Michelle Roche. Um, and then we have Jerry LeBay, uh, Jonah Bruger, and Tara Bruger. And Tara's going to speak to you next. on there and you guys kind of have this in here the background of what a CPAC is I think you all had a kind of look at that and then this just tells when we meet and our committee sub members um, within the CPAC group so this survey was really the first task that the CPAC that had come together here had really put our heads to it's a really big first task for kind of just forming this group and we really wanted to look at just overall general education satisfaction, special education satisfaction, um, <coughs> communication within both areas and find get parent feedback. We all know where we kind of stand with things and we wanted to really hear from the district as a whole, both general education and special education. So we created this survey. We'd been in touch with the Hatfield School District who had recently, I think, a year or two prior done a similar survey in regards to special education so we kind of used their survey as a model um, in conjunction with Pat who came and helped us develop these questions and all the CPAC members at that meeting we kind of developed all these questions we kept it short on purpose we're a new group we really wanted to be able to capture people's attentions and if it was too long we were worried we weren't going to get that and we really did work on anonymity as well the other thing that we did work really hard was to try and capture um, parents' voices that were placed outside of the district but still receiving services. So we were really trying to make sure that we ex included everybody in our survey. Um, so the survey, short, kind of quick came upon, opened 13 days total. In those 13 days, we got 176 responses, which is about 50% of the district. So we were actually really impressed with ourselves and, and with the district in general, honestly, as a whole. Um, and this chart is the response rate. So you can see preschool through sixth grade really had the highest response rate. We originally kept the survey open for seven days. And when we saw this number, we extended it for an additional six days. We saw the peak really after the first day the survey was open. So we figured we really only needed a few more days. And we tried to put emphasis on trying to get a little bit more information out of the Hopkins group and try to get a little well-rounded. But as you can see, the, still the majority of it is the elementary school. Um, and of that, and I think there's a slide that pertains to it, there 34% of the respondents were utilizing special education or in the process of utilizing special education. So then what we did next was we looked at um, overall general themes, and those themes were looked at between both our questions that we asked and in our open responses. So we wanted to make sure that we pointed out some of the positives in addition to some of the concerns that were made. So we got quite a few um, open responses that really pointed out pay, uh, parent satisfaction with Title I services. And so we thought that was really good to mention um, in regards to providers here. 
69% of respondents indicated that they had some level of agreement that their child's needs were being addressed within the general education um, curriculum. And I thought that was really important to point out as well. That's a really high number that indicated some level of satisfaction. Um, some of the concerns that parents had um, boredom with school curriculum in particular was a theme that came across a lot more for the middle and high school. Um, a lot of parents felt that MCAS preparations took up a lot of classroom time and a lot of dedication. And then there was a concern for a lack of communication between teachers and staff in relation to the parents in regards to curriculum as well. And again, we saw that a lot more in the high school. So you kind of... So then we looked at um, special education as well. One thing that we thought was really important as a CPAC is that respondents generally agreed that they knew how to request an evaluation within the school, how to request an independent evaluation, and that they knew their basic rights. And as a CPAC, that was really important to us. So that was a really important positive to take home for us. And then in regards to concerns that parents had, overall lack in communication, a concern for the amount of resources that we had available, um, numbers of service <coughs> providers that we had available, and then timeliness of the process in obtaining those services, just an overall concern there with parents. So I'll hand it over to Jonah. He's going to take a look at the data for you and hash that out. So I'm not going to actually talk about any of the particular numbers because they were all in the packet that we provided and it's going to be much more meaningful to read them than for me to just speak number. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but what I have up here is I just have a simple line graph and this shows the response rate for our general education um, and what it's trying to tell you is that for all of the questions that we asked with regards to general education, most of the respondents agreed or strongly agreed with the answers that we were asking them to answer to, and much less people disagreed with those statements. Um, looking at special education, the answers were a little bit more muddled, and a lot more people disagreed or strongly disagreed with what we were asking. So for example, if we were asking about the resourcing and staffing, a lot of people disagreed with those and said that no, we did not have adequate staffing and resources. Um, another one that there was a strong spike for strongly disagree was for the timeliness of the initial evaluation. However, that same one, if you can follow the line here, also has a strong spike for agree. So people just, in general, felt more strongly about the special education statements, either agree or disagree. And I'm going to ask a foolish question. Pulling up my y axis here. So I have my grade levels along the bottom, and then am I doing that? Yes, so I didn't bother to label my axes, and whoever in here is a science teacher can scold me later. <laughs> we have a class coming up. All right, great. <laughs> the y axis is the number of responses, and the x axis is the code associated. So one is strongly disagree, oh, sorry, and six is strongly agree. Okay. And it's so number, even, not percentage. That's what I was trying to get Yes, to it's the number of responses. Uh, if you go to the packet, we have pie charts that have the same information broken out per question, which makes it easier to follow. Mm -hmm. And for particular questions, we did highlight them here. So for example, the first question we asked was, my child's needs are addressed within the general education curriculum. And that's what Tara just told you. We did find that most people agreed with that. You can see that over 66% of the pie chart is taken up by the agree answers. Mm -hmm. We did also do a breakout where we looked at only people who indicated that they had children receiving or in the process of re receiving services. And for those general education questions for that subset or subpopulation, we did see that most people disagreed with the same statement. Um, and this is just highlighting these two things were something that we we're specifically interested in looking at. And our research or the survey did confirm that the sentiment among the parents survey was that there is a noticeable shortage of resources and staff. And these two were actually the lowest mean scores on the survey out of all of the questions we asked. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn it over to Jerry now. Oh, whoop, forgot about one thing. Um, so in conjunction with that, uh, we looked at the Department of Education data for the same question. And what we did was we pulled out the number of full-time 
uh, equivalent staff that we had for special education within the district. And then we looked at the number of disabled students reported to the state, and we took a ratio of that. And then we compared that to similar districts from the area, and we found out that we had the lowest ratio of any of the districts that we looked at the numbers for. What was that? Uh, 1 to 21. So we have one staff member for every 21 disabled students within the district. And full-time equivalents. Just so I can clarify something so I make sure I'm understanding it. Are these, are all of those ratios taken from the Department of Ed website? Yes. Okay. So all of this is off the DOE mm -hmm. website. Um, there's two different reports that you have to combine in order to get this data, but that's what we did. And actually, Keith, back there in the back row, this one is the one for us. Now I'll turn it over to Jerry. So just in summary, I know Tara touched a lot on this already, but um, one of the strengths that we saw um, overall was that um, most families were pleased that their students seemed happy in the district, which is really nice to hear. Um, that there were um, several positive comments about Title I services. Uh, generally, parents know how to request an evaluation and know their basic rights. And then on the concern side, um, there's concerns with the um, lack of communication between uh, staff and families and timeliness of obtaining services in district. Um, the data that we reviewed from DESE shows that the surrounding districts have that higher staff to student ratio within the special ed department. And as a CPAC, the parents that we surveyed, we, kind of, we saw that similarity that they also felt. Um, that lack of um, communication and uh, and not the appropriate numbers for staffing and resources. Mm -hmm. so, oh, I <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Jerry, can you help me understand the difference between yeah. oh. staffing and resources? So, um, and Tara, maybe you can help a little with this too. So, I believe that um, in regards to staffing, it's. Um, Staffing, we were considering special education staffing as well as service providers of so speech, OT, PT, um, all of those areas as well. Um, resources would be um, any resources that would be available within special education, so both um, uh, like curriculum kind of things as well as um, um, consultants. Am I yes. right on that? So, yes. like um, BCBA, I know, is consulted in things like that. So, just looking at all of those things. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this was our proposal as a CPAC. We really looked heavily at, you know, what were the positives, what were the needs, and we felt that it would be really a good moment to ask to form a task force to look at this more closely and see what more we can find out. So we would like to um, have school committee members, CPAC members, and special education staff members, both primary and secondary, um, involved in this. And ultimately, um, what they would do would be to um, review special education staffing, service providers, and those resources, and see um, what would be most suitable for our, to meet our special education students' needs. Um, and then to then go back and report to this information. We're hoping um, no later than the April 2016 school committee meeting, but ultimately, if we would need to have it sooner to drive budgeting for next year, we would want to make sure that that's taken into consideration as well. So, is there any questions or anything I missed? Or <laughs> Oh, right, my little sorry, the question is live. Phew, I feel prompted now. <laughs> so first, let me say it was a really well done survey that with so few questions you got so much information. It was a great survey. And it's great to also have, the because we heard the same thing that you've heard, so to have the survey response is very helpful. Um, and I asked you this because I didn't ask Heather, and it's honestly not because she's not here. Do you know if she's already volunteered to be on the task force? I don't I know. She not. Was, the, oh, we okay. have not yet Honestly, recruited. Not yes, yes. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> to volunteer, Heather. Yeah. <laughs> 
So you caught what? Well, no. Yeah. <laughs> so she, she no, she helped with people. the survey, but she didn't. She did come to one of our meetings and kind of give us a little bit of guidance on how to go about putting together a survey for the district and give us the example of the survey you guys had done a few years ago. So that way we kind of know like kind of the logistics of getting the survey together. Exactly. We already knew what we wanted to do, but we just kind of wanted to get the logistics. Where should we go? How do we get the most bang for our buck out of this in regards to getting the attention of the parents? Yes. Mm -hmm. So Okay. So I would think that the way we would assign a task, uh, a member to the task force is basically going to be on schedule. Because I know Heather's out for out of town for two weeks. You're going to be out most of March. I have a lot of evening meetings. You're always out in bat caves. <laughs> <laughs> so can you guys schedule your meetings and then maybe email Annie or me, and then we will make sure we get a school committee member there? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think the task force is a great idea because I think these are perennial questions, and I think the, um, the ratio is such a simple number, and I want to know what's behind it because it's so complicated with different providers and, and everything sure coming in. Um, I caution you against a budget change for next year. I think that if there's some significant need that it's not guaranteed that that would necessarily be able to be filled next year. To be well, presenter. yes, I was going to say that too. <laughs> In just a few minutes, we are about to get a presentation on our FY17 budget that we present to the select board for the first time next week. So we are well in underway in with right. the budget process. So I think it is important for the task force to meet quickly and to see what can be done. But I agree with Roby, our budget's trying to hit May town meeting. So. It's a bit late in the process, not impossibly late. And we were prepared for you to respond in that way, um, but never hurts to ask. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to know the need. Having that yeah. information and yeah. during the backdrop of all of these budget discussions now, that it's up well for next year. So it's um, I would not back off on the pace at all. Right. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. I'm sorry. Can you help me understand again the objectives of the task force? I understand this great data. Sure. Mm -hmm. And you want to figure out. Sure. We want to improve in some way, but do you have a sense of the task force also identifies what success looks like and then figures out how to get there? Uh, it sounds like you would be a great member for our task force. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. However, in terms of what it measures, I mean, there are a lot of uh, staff who contribute to educating our children with special needs or providing services for them. So when parents talk about a shortage, are they saying that there are not enough special education teachers? Um, or do they mean that they feel that there aren't enough OT or that these folks are stretched too thin? Because for example, they have many hats. They act as liaisons, they write IEPs, they go to IEP meetings, and they provide services to our students. So that's all anecdotal. Um, but we wouldn't be able to decipher that message from our survey we would really have to take a closer look, get in there, and see what what is it really like? What it, what is your caseload? What do you do? How many hats do you wear? Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I think maybe part of your question I missed. I actually have been working behind the scenes on some of that information to get some more just data behind some of the impressions because there definitely is um, a perception that may or may not be accurate based on the data. And so I've been looking at data back from 2005 through 2010 and 15 and have things that I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about tonight, but I would like to distribute some information that does shed some light on some of the things that you're asking for because I've done a little bit of homework already. I think um, my main um, impression after looking at numbers is that the types of disabilities that we're finding in the district has changed significantly over the last 10 years. And as a result, I did a little data um, assessments on how many service hours those different types of heavy hitting kind of disabilities require. And I think that is the crux of what we're experiencing as a pressure on the staff right now, that the types of disabilities that we're seeing more and more of require a lot more service hours. And so that 
um, definitely is a challenge for us. Um, I'll pass these out. If you could take some up to the uh, table there and save a couple for you guys. I can get more of these. I was under the gun to get things between a 2007 version of Excel and a 2010. They kept erasing my graph, so I apologize for the state of the other one. But um, the other um, information I have is really data about the, um, the number of FTEs we have, what their average number of service hours is over a course of a month based on student service grids. Now you're going to see inflated numbers. You say, well, if there's only 120 hours in a week, how could they possibly have 213 service hours? The fact of it is they see more than one child at a time. So obviously there's some doubling up, but that doesn't negate the fact that each one of those children, they have responsibility for writing and designing instruction <coughs> and delivering that instruction, assessing that um, progress and reporting out on that, as well as attending meetings, um, doing assessments, writing reports, and then presenting them. So that sheet there explains some of that um, information in a um, rudimentary way, and I certainly can clean that up with the help of the, the committee that wants to push forward and analyze what's going on. I think the general impression is that we don't have enough staff. We have about the same staff to student ratio we had over um, the course of 10 years with some variation by just, you know, a kid or two. And that's not a huge amount of change in staffing over 10 years. But I think the proof is in that type of um, service provision that we have to supply. So it is worth delving a little more deeply into. and. Um, and I do want to dispel the myth that we're really not good about timelines because we actually run an 88% rate this year on timeliness of our meeting the goals that the state requires us to do for 30 and 45 days out from request. And I know it seems like a long time when you go over Thanksgiving and then Christmas holidays. It feels like a real long time. But um, we're really not that bad at getting timelines met when we have our staff in the house, which has been a challenge with some a lot of medical and personal leaves that the department has faced this last 12 months. So um, I think we do have more to talk about. And it's a, I'm really, really impressed and <laughs> very pleased with the energy that these folks here have supplied to really delving into their child's experience in the school. And I thank you guys. Thank did you have you scheduled or thought about schedule for your task the task force meeting? No, no, we have not. Um, I think we thought as far as asking the school <laughs> committee for that, um, but we're definitely energized after this survey um, and ready to contribute further. Um, it's it's great to feel like you're really partnering with the district in your child's education. Um, and doing something that serves others, so we're we're ready to go. We can. And we our can first work on meeting that. is next week. Or our, our monthly next meeting CPAC is meeting. next week, so maybe we can coordinate with oh, Annie to see if we can perfect. get somebody on board to come to that sure. meeting. Great. Yes, it's the third at six thirty at the elementary school. And it, isn't it always the first uh, our Thursday of the month? CPAC meetings yeah. are always the first Thursday of the month. We have one scheduled for March, April, and May at this point. So I think this is great. Personally, I'd love to be engaged. I just, as, as you said, I, it's hard for me to commit given my time frame. So as we plan out a meeting, um, maybe I'll try to make that one next week and see if I can, we can plan out some time. Should, Should be great. Be great. Yeah. Send out an email. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really well done. Thank you so much. I have your next giving us the district. It's in your packet. Strategy I will read it to you if you have any questions about it, but it's just a monthly progress report on district strategy. Some of the actions that we've undertaken in the last month to move us closer to our strategic objectives. Thank you. I read it. Anyone does anyone have questions? Thank you for that. Sure. And also in your packet, you have a letter from Kirsten Kennedy, the nurse 
at Hadley Elementary School. This doesn't require school committee action. I just wanted to provide you with some information on some of the activities that our elementary school, and in particular Nurse Kennedy, would like to do as part of our health grant that we receive from the state. So they are looking to designate the month of May as a month to celebrate the uniqueness of all families. And uh, we're looking to promote the values of mutual respect, acceptance, and understanding, and looking at similarities and difference in our families. Um, all Families Are Special Month will be kicked off with a visit to each classroom, and Kirsten Kennedy will read the book All Families Are Special by Todd Parr. And they're also looking to have students create um, drawings and poems and descriptions of what makes their family special. And ultimately, they hope to put together all of these, um, all of the input of the students and combine that into one book. And they're looking, hope, hoping to publish that book and have it available, publish it in a small way and have a copy available at the library and other places. So we just wanted to bring the school committee up to speed on that and let them know about some of the activities that we're doing. And in addition to that, you don't have a letter to this effect, but I also know at Hopkins Academy, we have our nurse as part of our, our kind of support and health activities for students. We have our nurse and one of our teachers who will have an, an optional, they'll identify students and invite them, um, but it's entirely optional and they're looking to offer yoga a few times a week in the morning before school starts as an alternative to being in the, in the cafeteria in the morning and mindfulness practices. Great. This is at both schools? Or? So Hopkins, Hopkins is looking to start yoga and mindfulness and on a very small scale. And we identified a yoga teacher, I, I understand, and someone who can teach mindfulness as well. And then the All Families Are Special is a project that had the elementary school be undertaking this year. That was just for information. Thank you. Really great. Sure. All right, and I think it's time for business. Oh, and your personnel report is in The here. personnel report's really boring this month, so it's on to you, Chris. Things. Boring is good. Unfortunately, yeah, it's boring is good, good for the personnel report. <laughs> Had I known, I would have tried to make it a little more entertaining. Um, so you have the year-to-date expense report as the first item we can go over. Uh, we made a number of transfers to cover uh, negative balances in some accounts where we had excess balances in another account to make up for it. So you'll see very little in terms of negative balances on here at this point in time. There still are a few remaining, but as we started to research them, they're really a result of the fact that at one point in the school year, typically towards the end, we transfer money from the preschool revolving account, or we actually we transfer expenses from the regular budget to the preschool revolving account to reflect their usage in Hadley Elementary and so those negative balances will be brought back up to zero once we make those transfers. So they're they're kind of false negatives really, um, but they're, they're there at this point in time so they show up on the report. Um, again, really not much in terms of concern. Uh, the only area that we're really kind of skating a thin line at this point in time would be um, the maintenance area where we've just had a number of repairs that needed to be made that were not expected. Uh, and so, as a result of that, we're, we have money, but uh, just not a lot, so we're kind of praying that everything stays working until the end of the year. And uh, we'll see how that goes. But other than that, uh, you know, really no concerns at this point in time. Just wanted to mention a couple of things. If you look at items like the teacher salaries, um, and you might say, oh my God, you know, we, we only have a couple hundred thousand left. Please keep in mind that um, five days worth of every teacher's salary goes into the professional development line at the end of the year as well, so there's another 100000 And then we have the school choice money of 520000 as well that has not been applied yet. So it's actually, again, it looks worse than it is. Are we going to need a vote eventually to move? We will, actually, yeah. Do you want to do that now? Or that would no? be great. Yeah, yeah. it would just allow us to get it done. So we, so we would need a motion to move the 520000 from school choice reserve to the operating budget? Actually, we would need the motion to move $520,000 of expenses from the budget to the school choice account. We, we can't oh. make the budget bigger by moving money into it, okay. but we can make the expenses smaller by moving it out. Rules. And, okay. <laughs> it's an odd rule. Yes. Um, 
Do you want us to do that now, or do you want to make sure there aren't more unexpected maintenance expenses um, that could increase that number higher? If you wanted to do that now, that would be great, and then if, if we needed to, we could certainly come back for any kind of okay. unexpected. I mean, to be honest, I don't foresee them, but you know, things break, you don't really expect them to. Um, but at this point in time, I, I don't see it that we would need to you know, dip into okay. it more. So a motion, how motion, he said? Motion to move $520,000 of expenses to the school choice budget. I'm just sorry, can, I'm not following. Where did you get the 520 number? We, when we built the FY16 budget, Last we year. knew we needed to use 520000 from the reserve account. Okay. Second. Got it. All right. Good. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Done. Yeah. Yours. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next report we have is the grant report. Again, you can see some of the grant balances are, are moving down, or the remaining balance is moving down at this point in time. Um, before the next meeting, we will have more transfers done to these grants, more expenses moved in. Um, in particular, the 391 grant, which is the preschool grant, where actually, because we, we got notice of it, or the amount we've received later in the year, a lot of the expenses went right to the preschool revolving account, and now we're going to move those out and move them into the grant now that we actually have the, uh, the money. So as a result of that, you'll see the available balance in the grant going down, and you'll see the revolving preschool balance go back up. Um, but again, you know, the, these accounts are all in good shape. Any questions on those? Just because I, it's tradition that I ask about the lunch account every meeting, um, the, the big swing must have been a large <clears throat> purchase? No, actually, I have an email. <laughs> I wish, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have an email into the town accountant asking if they did not post the January um, state reimbursement. And I'm, I, I did mention that. I said it went from positive 9 yeah, to negative a, 6 in one month. That's a big swing. Um, yeah, that is a big swing. So as soon as I hear, actually, I can forward the answer to you guys if you want as soon as I receive it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I, I feel I must add, really, that um, I know I've mentioned how we struggled with, um, with the town account arrangement. And I do have to say that in the past month, it's gotten 100% better. They are on top of things now. They're responding to our requests. And, and it, it's really gotten significantly better. So, Excellent. No, if I can mention that it was failing, I can certainly mention when it's going <laughs> That's right. Well, so. right. And, uh, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Thank Chris. You. And there is, just with your budget paperwork, um, there is additional information that just around school choice, the students around choice, charter, this is a conversation that we've been talking about, vocational and special education, and uh, where students go. Um, under choice, you see listed in your packet the district, these are students choicing out in the corresponding tuitions that we would pay. Um, we are still to the good in choice. We have more students choicing in than we have choicing out. Uh, charter schools and the tuitions associated with those. Smith Vocational and special district, uh, out of district placements are not listed individually, but just the total amount that you would see, and you'll see some of that in the budget as well. So we move on to school committee reports, starting with finance subcommittee. Heather's out of town. She and I did talk about um, the budget and the budget presentation. We are scheduled to present the budget to a first draft of our budget to the select board on March 2nd, which is, I think, next Wednesday? Next Wednesday at 7.15, if anyone would like to join the party. At least Annie and I will be there. And Chris. And Chris, good. So I'm telling you, it's a first presentation of the budget to select board. Did I say school committee? I no, might have. No. Sorry. Um, and we prepared a PowerPoint. Heather and I talked about it, and Chris and Annie and I prepared it, except we didn't talk about who was giving it. So <laughs> neither did we actually. So we're ready to know. So we'll just all interrupt each other, and we have a PowerPoint on the budget. Okay. Uh, where, where is that? We're doing it right now because we have decisions to make related to the budget, but but it is but we would hope that you would look at this 
PowerPoint presentation as not only a presentation to you and to our viewing audience, but also keep it, kind of look at it as this is what we would present to the select board and that viewing audience, and then at the end we have a few decisions to make. And I think part of the goal is to look for feedback from the entire committee as to what goes before on March 2nd. Yeah. So March 2nd, 7.15? 7.15. Town Hall. Town Hall. So the first slide here, we just decided it was important to put the district strategy document. This is the document that the school committee worked together on over the summer. We don't have every single priority under the strategic objectives, just so the slide can remain readable. Almost readable. <laughs> Better than what it Yes. We've already said this, our school choice numbers. So one, it's to provide information to uh, people in town, to the select board. I think it also demonstrates that Hadley <coughs> is, by making strategic investments in schools, you have schools that attract people and keep people, and that's important. Our FTE analysis, so you can see from FY15 to FY16, uh, this current year, we added the substantially separate classroom, which is where you see one additional teacher between 15 and 16. In addition, in our substantially separate classroom in special education, we added three paraprofessionals or educational support professionals. So that's why you see the increase in full-time equivalents in between FY15 and FY16. And in FY17, we have them at this point projected to be as they are in FY16. The town directed us, just for the folks who are in the audience, the history on this is that the town asked us to submit a projection as early as January. They expect numbers from us so they can start building their budget, and the town provides direction to the school committee about how to prepare that budget. The town requested the departments prepare a level services budget. So not additional services, but what will it cost you to provide the same level of service that you currently provide. I want to be clear that none of these slides are also meant to imply that anything you said was not heard at all. The town direction was create a level services budget, and you'll see at the end of the slides when we did that, the budget impact on just staying level service, which is probably why you heard from some members that FY17 might be very tight. We, we did get requests, particularly from the elementary school, for some increases in staffing, which because of the direction to prepare a level service budget, we did show that to the school committee, I believe, in January. And there was discussion about, based on what just level services had done to the bottom line, that that's where we had to keep our focus for the moment, is how would we protect what we currently do. And so this is our current fiscal year and our current operating budget, which was a 4.8% increase from FY15. However, the increase to the local contribution, what the town uh, provides, so what, in other words, the local contribution, the total budget is, is offset by things like the school choice amount that you just heard, applying school choice monies, applying grant monies, applying revolving account monies, putting expenses for pre-K into the pre-K revolving account. And so if our grant monies uh, go down, the, there's a disproportionate impact on the local contribution as opposed to the whole budget. That's why your total operating can have a, a smaller in percentage increase than what happens on the town side. So sorry. you see what, uh, sorry. Yep. Well, just, uh, just a couple of points. On, um, would it be helpful to also show the uh, student enrollment? I know you looked at the school choice numbers, but I'm trying to get data points here. So if our budget just is uh, stable, is flat, essentially, so it also includes an increase. So you're saying grants and school choice things must have decreased, costs have obviously increased, but also our income decreased from 15 to 16? So the it, grants. The, the impact grants. on local was, contribution, correct. Was so you, mostly the grants. Mostly the grants. Yeah. So that sort of, what, what percentage decrease was that from 15 to 16? Well, we have some slides okay. on grants as well that we'll show. But is enrollment, um, enrollment's pretty much stayed the same. The actually, year. this year we have, we took a hit on enrollment this year. So in our October 1 data for FY15, for last October 1, 10-1-2014 would be FY15's data, last October. Did you do that right? 
October, yeah, yeah. Um, in last school year. That we were at about 623, and this 10 1 is closer to about, I think, 606. We had an increase in Hadley Elementary of roughly six students, I think, overall. We had a net decrease at Hopkins with the greatest hit occurring in grade nine. That's not 100% Smith folk, but that's where students make the decision to go to Smith vocational. Um, and certainly charter school enrollments are what impact Hopkins Academy, um, particularly students who may be waitlisting at Hopkins for um, the performing arts charter school um, sometimes. Yeah. And if I can just jump in on that local contribution a little bit. Uh, first of all, one of the reasons why it was increased is because the prior year we used $530,000 in school choice money. We used 520 this year. So obviously that, you know, a lower school choice amount means a higher local contribution. And the other point I wanted to make is that the grants of 363, 858, we actually ended up receiving more than that. Um, unexpectedly, especially, well, actually almost all in the circuit breaker money, which it's not tec technically a grant, but we included it with the grant money. Um, and so, you know, this is the budget that was approved last year. That was the expected amount of grant money. And a little bit later on when we show the unbudgeted expenses, you'll see um, in the special ed out-of-district tuitions, there was a, a substantial increase in the amount that we saw um, in this year. Um, and that will be covered by this increased um, circuit breaker money that we were able to carry over from last year. So um, it's a it's a long circle of <laughs> of things that are all connected. And so in FY17, you can see the changes there and the increases. What we're looking at this is the level services budget. So not expanding, but current level services and. That's the impact on the total operating and on local contribution. In FY17 and FY18, you're going to see some, some increases in, in contracted, in, in collective bargaining agreements and salaries that were very conscious. So for example, in some of the, the collective bargaining agreements, we looked at the salaries of our teaching staff and where those salaries were very low compared, we did a regional analysis, we corrected, not always across the board, we corrected steps where we were not competitive, and that correction was phased in over a two-year period. Um, so in those two years are fiscal year 17 and fiscal year 18. This slide has been something that Chris put together when he started here. It's a great slide, it shows what percentage of the budget, how we spend it in terms of cost centers. Um, the, the next slide was Linda's idea, and this, this is to demonstrate, um, you know, when sometimes if we're talking to the town and, and folks might say, well, you just got to make some cuts, and you can see that roughly 70% of the budget is people. So the, to have a significant impact to, in reducing the budget would require touching people. And that's something that folks just need to be aware of. And obviously, with the remaining percentages, they do not include salaries. When we are maintenance utilities, right. it's not the custodial salaries in there because we already had it included in the salary line. And this, the purpose of this slide here is to, to just help folks understand that these are expenses that Communities uh, have a moral and a legal obligation to pay. Students are entitled to pursue vocational education if they so choose, and the town must pay for that and, and uh, support their transportation that goes with that. And in special education, we're required by law to provide the least restricted environment where students can get a free and appropriate public education, and in some cases, that requires that students go to out-of-district schools. And you can see um, we are projecting the potential for a pretty significant increase um, in that for FY17, which again goes to how come a level services budget goes up that much. So how we fund the budget. This was something that 
Uh, Linda was interested in looking at grant money over time. It's a little hard to read here, but that light blue at the top are discretionary grants. Discretionary grants are those grants that you apply for that you're not guaranteed to get, as opposed to grants. The majority of our grants are entitlement grants. They have always been entitlement grants. Um, there was a time period a couple years before that, 2010, 2011, 2012, where our grant funds uh, were much higher. But those were also entitlement grants. If you guys remember, it was called ARA, the American Recovery, I can't even remember what it stood for. Reinvestment Act. Reinvestment Act, thank you. ARA, to kind of stop the bleeding on um, in the public sector, the feds gave out tons of money, and race to the top. So the grants peaked at a point, but they also were entitlement grants. But this is a pretty important one in, in showing what's happened to grants, and that, that, that I think on the town side there's been some question of why aren't you better at writing grants anymore. And you'll see actually that our discretionary grants have gone up since 2014 each year, but the entitlement grants have gone down, and that's just cuts at the federal government level. Right. We get, for example, our special education 240 grant. Um, it assists us with all kinds of things. The, the state tells us how much money, and the application is essentially, you're telling them how you'll spend the money, but they've already decided how much money you're going to get. My mouse is away. There we go. And the school committee is always interested in looking at reserve funds. This is funded through school choice money, so our beginning balances. And if we apply $520,000 in FY17, we have a projected ending balance in FY17 of $658,438. And Roby, you've heard rumor that people, some people think we're sitting on, a million I or believe two. it would be called a pot of gold. <laughs> <laughs> a million or two million? We are not. <clears throat> and, you know, the thing is that a lot of this is a timing issue. Right. right. We use the school choice money at the end of the school year. So at that point in time, we have the balance going in plus all of the distribution, but we haven't oh. had the use come out yet. Right. So, so they oh, look, you so know, if you have the, the 656 and 545, you're a million right. too. Right. right. And then, so people see that not knowing, we use 3000 for prior year expenses, not knowing that 520000 is coming right back out of that by the end of the year. So it can be a little misleading, and it's probably important just to get that word out there. Yeah. The balance you see isn't necessarily the balance that will be there. Yeah, but what's the net balance after you've done that? It's not It's not like $100,000. It's No, it's, it'll still it, be 500000 plus. Right, right. right. Yeah. The net balance is essentially our it's projected ending, is what, right. correct? That's so, correct. Right, yes. yes. Okay. So you're projected in so, so it's, it's not mid. nothing. It's not nothing. Right. 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 Okay. Where's the statement? Statement. Chapter 70 goes to the town. And one of the reasons that the school committee had talked about the importance of maintaining a, a reserve fund was to take care of unanticipated expenses. And one thing we didn't include in here was also when necessary to, um, if we need to, to make investments. We, we had talked about this, for example, in our substantially separate classroom. You know, I believe we ended up revising the operating budget, but that's an example of where if the school committee said, yes, this is an investment that we want to make right now, and we don't have the budget for it. That's part of the reason that school committee has reserved. So this just shows some of the unexpected expenses that we had in FY16. This year, which is much higher than last year, this nice. year we are um, looking at this point of, of providing more speech and language support at the preschool level. Therefore, there would be more expenses that the preschool, that's why we would, we're applying this money from the preschool revolving account and additional accounts. It's, or is this 100% preschool revolving, Chris? Is this that, is yeah. The net amount would be 100% preschool. Preschool yes. revolving. So the reason that it is going up is because consciously we're looking to um, put additional speech services into preschool and then all expenses that are attributed 100% to preschool come out of preschool revolving. So this uh, is just a summary of if we're at level programming, that's a 5.86% increase. 
less revolving account money used, less school choice money used, uh, less our projected grant, which creates a total local contribution, which is still just shy of 6%, 5.76% increase. Which we, well, which we should pause here and say that the town has made it clear to us for the last several years that when we keep coming to them with increases this high, they are overwhelmed. Yeah, and I think, do you know what the increase is for the total town budget between 2.5% tax and new growth? I think I, I saw 4 point something. About 400,000? No, 4 point something percent increase in the, on the town. Oh, yes, but I think, amount. yes, I think that's right. Right. And so we are going, we are coming in right now with the level services budget that represents more than the natural increase. than growth right. in the town. And I believe we can assume other departments are too. Yes. So what Heather and I asked Annie and Chris to do is if we needed to, Annie and Chris have basically already scoured this budget, and there isn't, there isn't fluff in this budget. These are really looking at every single line item. Right. But there are things we can do, which I think will be on the next slide. Please. Yes. So we could squeeze another $86,000 by, instead of building tech into the budget, like we said, for the last five years, we're going to build tech into our budget and rather than rely on donations and gifts of helping entirely, relying on donations and gifts from Helping Hearts and the trustees. We could remove that from the budget. We have opportunities with Pat's retirement to change that position. We could add more circuit breaker funds. Um, we could, I th what is the, us MASC not going conference. to the MASC conference, I think, saves $2,000, something like that. Um, we've looked at some transportation costs that we might be able to avoid. We've looked at Jack Horrigan's retirement to see if there would be a way to change how we staff that position. And, um, do you want to speak to some of the ones on the bottom? Yeah, what's the very I'll last one? The very last one, one and I'll also comment that on a couple of other, the two above it, because I know some folks in, in the audience are probably very interested in, in the last three there. The reduced contract of transportation and special education is, and all of these the school committee should understand, these are placing our best bet. So for example, we may have students now who are using yellow bus transportation to go to a community placement to practice some independent living skills. And because by taking the yellow bus, a school bus, they're not, they're not benefiting from any sort of transportation learning. It's one thing that we have a student that we're taking on PBTA, uh, PBTA and, and teaching them how to use that system. We're taking a student to a place for community contribution and engagement. So I've reached out, if a student, if we have students at, at schools, I've reached out to places where the students might be able to walk, community places where they could walk rather than needing to, to take a bus. I still say it's you're placing a bet in the reduction because next week a student could require contracted services in, in, in transportation. Right now, the existing way that we're delivering that service, there's absolutely an opportunity for us to say we could, the student could walk to some other community buildings and places and do the same work um, without reducing any benefit to the children, without reducing any benefit to the children. The school site colleges configuration was, um, as it was a couple of years ago, the, there was a 1.0 FTE of school psychologist for the district, 0.5 counselor at Hadley Elementary School, so either a, a licensed uh, school social worker or a licensed adjustment counselor, and 0.5 at um, Hopkins Academy as well. So this would just be the possibility of looking at returning to a 1.0 school psych and 0.5 counselor instead of having 1.8 school psych. So which school is losing the adjustment counselor? 
What's that? Which school is losing the adjustment counselor? Nobody's losing the adjustment counselor. I didn't say this. Well. Uh, so right now at Hopkins Academy, right. you have you right now you have a school psychology position right. that is school wide so right. for 1.0. Yeah. You have a 0.5 adjustment counselor here at Hopkins. You have 0.8 school psych down at HES. So you could replace. You could go back to having a counselor at the elementary school. Right. At 0.5, yeah. still retain 1.0 school mm -hmm. site district wide mm -hmm. right. for the department. Yeah. Uh, these are just two. Linda's point: uh, there not being a lot of places. It wasn't like we could open up the budget and say, "Oh wow, look at all that money we just kind of shoved over there and didn't think about." This is what wasn't easy, and this doesn't result in level services. <laughs> this doesn't result in level services. Um, now you're talking some reductions. Um, and the cost share, the BCBA stands for Board Certified Behavior Analyst. So right now we contract out for those services. There is another neighboring district that also has a need for this. And so we believe that if we were to hire, we would actually perhaps in that case increase. We would look to increase the amount of, we'd increase what we are getting. So we'd get more FTE. We'd get more hours of service for less money if we could get an employee that we shared the cost of with another district. Third party contractors for BCBA. Sorry, the symbols are going. <laughs> if those go quietly, it's going to be remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> um, so third party, contracting with a third party or third, another agency for BCBA can be rather expensive, just as it can for all related services, speech language, physical, and occupational therapies. So, the, so with this, you know, in, in my opinion, this is less than a level services budget. Right. Here's the advantage of it, is the next slide, I think, what is that the local contribution mm -hmm. is reduced to a 4.4% increase, which is more in line with the growth right. of, with yeah. the financial growth of the town, so that we would be bringing a budget that matches growth, but is less than level services. And so that's the, the discussion we need to have tonight is what budget are we bringing to the select board on March 2nd, with or without these reductions? So the, as Did we do another slide of like what was requested versus versus no? Thank you. <laughs> Questions, <laughs> comments. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, you know, I haven't been through this before, other than the tail end of last year. But why not start with what was asked of us, um, and not presume an answer? I know because of the history. Because the history, point. but not to say that we haven't thought through other options. Um, yeah. Um, I would prefer to go in with the lesser amount um, because what we've been asking for in past years and the struggles we've had in getting it. Um, and we already know that the requests from other town departments are high um, and I think favored by the select board. Um, so I think to go in with a more reasonable request is good. I think they are going to run the balance of the school choice accounts, and I think it's certainly conceivable if I were them, I would make the same argument that you could make it up to the school choice if you had to. So. Which we could. I think that I, we could for FY17. Right. It is time limited. Exactly. How many years we could. And so the, mm -hmm. the discussion we would have to have then with the select board is, this is time limited. You cannot continually eat away at that reserve account. Mm -hmm. We know we always have unanticipated expenses. We never go to the town and ask for them to fund unanticipated expenses in a fiscal year. We eat into our savings account, and then something dramatic needs to happen. And the drama could be a town-wide two and a half override, which I personally think makes a lot of sense. I may not be the majority. We, Annie and I have talked about we could add um, athletic fees or activity fees. We've talked about this in the school committees in, in years past. 
we could charge for transportation at Hopkins. Also talked about in many Which times we've in the also past. talked about in the past, and mm -hmm. we've not implemented any of these things. So I do think we're at a point where level services is. If we go, if we do this, Roby, mm -hmm. and we're cut even further, then mm -hmm. to maintain level services, we are using more school choice than we're bringing in. Well, I think the argument you presented tonight, I think they would hear that you have already anticipated their objections and tried to comply with them. Oh, so you think they? I think it's a stronger argument. Would. You think we'd have a better chance of getting our budget if we went with this? I do. Linda, yes, can I make an observation? Yep. Would you go back to the co um, cost reduction possibility, please? I, I guess it feels very heavily weighted on student services when you have so many other aspects of the school budget that don't really get considered in the reductions. I have to advocate for the fact that uh, you have a parent group here looking to increase services, right. not reduce yep. services. And, you know, that most of those have a direct impact on student services. Yep. Humera? I'm interested um, in Annie's perspective specifically on which items will hurt most in terms of operations. I mean, you, you've, you've probably weighed, like, obviously there's not fluff here, mm -hmm. um, but you've weighed which ones would really, like, okay, we'd have to white knuckle it through um, the issues that are. Sure. So some of the impact on these things, I mean, the, the difficulty is, I think that Pat brings up an extremely valid point, and I do want to say that it certainly, we, I just want to be clear that we didn't look at only one part of the budget, we looked at the entire budget. Um, and it's, it's just difficult uh, to find places. So the implications of all of these things, purchasing tech with donations and gifts, we've talked about this before. Expecting philanthropic organizations to fund things that really should be part of operating costs is probably not a good strategy over the long term. Not to mention um, the fact that the town told us to build in our regular tech needs into our operating budget, mm -hmm. not to hit them again with a big need. So, correct. So there, that was, that's another point there that we are, by doing this, we're not doing what the town instructed after they provided um, a substantial amount of money for technology. The restructuring of the assistant superintendent, as you know, Ms. Bell does many things in addition to overseeing special services. Um, she works with English language learners, Title I. So if you're wondering how does that get done, I do it. So there's certainly an impact there, I will, I'll tell you, but um, if we need to save money, we need to save money. Apply potential uh, additional circuit breaker funds. This is again one of those hedging our bets. We anticipate increased circuit breaker revenues. If they come in, fantastic, and if they don't, they don't. Um, I've already spoken to reducing the contract of transportation in special education. I think perhaps one of the, the more difficult ones is the point time. I'm not completely convinced that it's, it's a, a bad idea to have a counselor versus a school psych available at the elementary school. Sometimes those skill sets are very different with the kind of work that they like to do. So I certainly think that the elementary school experienced benefits when they had a counselor on staff. But also, to the point that was made during the presentation, one of the concerns that was expressed was around um, the amount of services and resources that were available, staffing that was available in special education, and school psych is a, is a special education function. Although at the elementary school, the reason we were able to replace, go with the school psych over a counselor is our particular, the person there has a lot of knowledge of positive behavioral interventions and supports and does a lot to support the regular ed environment. But that could certainly have an impact on the, the stress of meeting timelines. As Ms. Bell pointed out, there's an 88.5% 88, 88 percentage rate of meeting timelines on time. 
Um, so the district isn't doing terribly in that regard. But certainly if you're in the 10% where that timeline wasn't met, um, that's, that's pretty frustrating. And one of the pieces of meeting those timelines is ensuring that assessments are done in a timely manner. And there are some assessments that only a school site can do and read. And there's what the state legally mandates is the appropriate amount of time. But then there's just customer perception. Right. Absolutely. What is right. the right appropriate amount of time in terms of their child is only getting yep. older. Right. Cycles just change right. so quickly. Um, it's right. might not be good enough. Well, Linda, how, how important, I mean, you've, you and I have sat through many years of the budget cycle with the town. How important is it to them that we not spend down the reserve of, special, of school choice? I mean, I think that's really the issue, is whether we, you could make those cuts and still know that if we needed to, we'd take it out of school choice. Mm -hmm. right? We have always voted to do that. So how important is it going to be to the town to have us maintain that financial model where we're not taking out more than is coming in? I don't think it's that important. I think it's more important to us I, I than do, it I, is right. to them. Right. right. You agree? Oh, I do. Yeah. <laughs> I think I we see the point of having a yes. very a healthy savings account so that we are prepared right. to be able to pay for unforeseen expenses. Right. right. And so, but to that point, we could go in and say a level services budget represents a 5.76% increase. Mm -hmm. You tell us what you're going to give us, Good. and we will either use more school choice or cut the budget. There are risks and consequences to both of those decisions. Right, right. Because if we start cutting, if we start right. cutting, the point of that macro slide is if we start cutting, it's people. Right. And you lose staff, then you're going to lose students. Right, right. And it will be a cascadingly bad thing. Right. We continue to go too far into our savings account. You know, budget 101 is you don't use your savings account to cover operating. Right. But we already. But we already, already do. do. Every year. Right. Every year. Yeah. By yep. more than a half million dollars. Exactly. So. Yep. And if our our school choice numbers are. We, you showed it to us. Mm -hmm. There, uh, we're not losing children anymore. We're no, no we're losing. Of, we have we have significant. Well, we, we do. We still do. But in terms of like what the net is, it's pretty mm -hmm. flat, mm -hmm. right? If we if we were to increase, then we could more strongly justify using some of that increase towards operating. Is that is that a good way to look at it? Not in Linda's um, model. Not in the I model don't think that I we've been using. The question. Like if we if we had you know substantially more school choice students in? coming in, so we yes. were netting positive on the school choice side, it would make we would be more um, assured that our balance wasn't. Yes, sustainably I going think lower. if we brought more more school choice in, we would feel more comfortable using more of the savings account. Right, and that's why we had approved earlier to to hit a max more maximum number, but that. Seem to mainly more affect the elementary school, right? Not Hopkins. Right. And we are to the good on school choice. Right. In numbers and in finances, we are to the good. One thing that we have no control over, and again, it doesn't make it bad, it just is, our, our charter school tuitions are over a half a million dollars. Um, they're $537,000 uh, right now in FY16. Um, and then you saw the, the projections for vocational and out of district where we do not have an appropriate program for a student. We'd certainly love to have students here, but we don't have the programming for them, and that's over a million dollars. So of that total budget, you're looking at $1.6 million in FY17 that is um, out of district tuitions. Yeah, but, but the select board will, will be quick to tell you mm -hmm. that the school choice funds come off the cherry sheet. They don't come mm -hmm. out of our budget. So. I'm not sure that argument is... I didn't bring happen. choice in there. I brought charter. Oh, the charter as well, they're going to point out. Yes. Well, charter and, and choice. The, the, the money that goes to pay other districts comes the from 1. the town. 6 it doesn't, said, it doesn't run through right. our budget. Right. The 1.6, I didn't include the choice, but I did include charter. You're, so. Right. So it's, it, that's a trick. That's a, mm -hmm. And that's a sore subject with the town. Mm -hmm. what do you mean? It's not part of the 7.8 or 7.3? No. 
The 1.6 is in part of 7.3? The Smith vocational tuition, special yes. education, out of district tuition is part of the total operating budget. But, but, but kids district. that choice out and kids that go to charter schools, the cost for those kids is taken off the top of the, just off of the top, you could say, of the town side because right. it's taken off the top before the town is given its local aid. And so it's an expense that is that is born on the town side. So it's in their best interest that we have a strong school and you not bet. lose students. Oh, That's been the argument we've that we've used every year. For years. <laughs> for years. For years. For years. So Which they got. The one yeah. year we didn't do well, we where we had we were more even with choice mm -hmm. in and out. Mm -hmm. right. Then it was a clear message. Mm -hmm. But it, there, it's a lot. It, there's a lot of murk here. Yes. That's <laughs> really what it is. There are no easy answers. No. There are no easy answers. But I have to say that you've provided a list of possible solutions, ways to cut, that we could always um, change our minds about by dipping into oh, school choice absolutely. later. Right. So I, I I think it's a sound approach to go in at the the exact amount increase as the town, the four point whatever percent. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean there so will we could, be other years. We could we, say a level yeah. services budget represents a five point seven six increase oh, yeah. to oh, the yeah. to the town. Right. We are willing to match growth in the town, whether that's 4.4 or 4.5, and right. we will decide what we are going to do, right. whether make cuts or use additional school choice. Right. But why? So I'm missing. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know the dynamics. And so I heard you say that the other com uh, components of the budget won't be doing that. That they're going to come well, and ask for more. I don't know. I haven't. I, I've. Someone sent me the town budget. I haven't studied it in in detail. I think there's something to be said after years of increases that made them very unhappy, but we had very good arguments for to have a year when you come in and say, we want not more than our fair share, but we want our fair share. There are ramifications to that long term that you need to understand in terms of using school choice or cuts. Um, I just think this year it's a better argument. But, but we you could can go the wrong. other way. We could be wrong. What's the risk for coming in and say, here's what you asked for? Uh, well, I, um, is there a risk? Yeah, there's a risk because the reputation of the schools has been that they've been asking for more than their fair share. Right. I don't think that's necessarily true. No. But, um, but it, relative to other departments who have not gotten what they've uh, what they've wanted year and, after year because are, of the schools, they're all legitimate requests. Yeah. So if we can manage this, I think it's a a good argument to not to to go with what is appropriate. Not without letting them know what exactly what the consequences are. You know, this is a level services budget the way that you have described it, but. I've been a part of contentious budget years. <laughs> Here in town? Yeah, oh, yeah. I've, I mean, we've, we've all seen it. Um, and there will be times when we need more than our fair share, but if, if we can manage to keep it reasonable, I think it makes sense to, it'll go a long ways politically, I would imagine. Maybe what we want to do is is um, add a couple of slides of the survey results that would show that this would, you know, that that making making these cuts doesn't match the results of the district-wide survey that just went out, and that so for us that coming down to this percent increase is a risk and a challenge and an expense that we will bear somehow. Mm -hmm. But that this but that the 
Select Board and Finance Committee should know that yeah. add so add a couple slides of the survey results. What do you think? I don't know about a couple, maybe one. Okay. One. Because you don't really have the information that you would need to answer right. the questions. You right. have a ratio that you don't know all the yes, components totally to. Yes, totally agree. Um, so. Well, maybe it's the um, one slide of the student-teacher ratio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that's a powerful slide. Mm -hmm. Can we borrow a slide? Yeah, Actually, Linda, um, yep. you, can, you can ask me for anything you want, and I can give it to you from the data, because I still have everything. Okay. So if there's something specific you want, you can compile it for you. All right. And before I forget, would you please send me a copy? I need to make the slideshow available to the public, because it was shown at school committee. It has to be a copy in our office. Just a, a hard copy if you email it to me, so it's available to the public. So, Chris, this is you, we, we can You have some time. We could work on Monday on this, changing some things around? Sure. All right. Okay. So I like the way you said it, to start off with, here's our best assessment of meeting the request. Here's a flat budget. We understand that is above and beyond. So I understand the relationship piece. I understand the politics piece, the good team player piece. Um, I'm relying on your experience to say that that will carry forward. I'm not always sure that that's true. I guess that's where I'm a little skeptical. Next year when we come in, and if we have an extra request, we can say, well, you were great last year. We'll give you this one. And I'm not sure that's how that works. But um, obviously there's memories here, right? You all are reacting to your memories. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then, if we, I also don't, I wouldn't specify where we would cut. I totally right. agree. Mm -hmm. right. They don't need to know that. Right. It's our decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. This was for you guys to, to, gotcha. to talk yeah. about. Gotcha. You know that if it, we could do this, if we do this, it's less than level services, and to Pat's point, it's impacting student services. It's not what we would want to do. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, just so the community understands, the town doesn't have the authority, the school committee has ultimate authority over its budget. The town does not have the authority to tell the school committee how to cut a budget. They have no authority over lines. Just at the end of the day, they decide, they can say to the school committee, sorry, all you're getting is X. That they have the authority to do, but they can't tell them where to cut anything. Yeah. Okay, do we basically have a strategy? We're going to come in strongly with saying we would like level services, that we would find a way to match growth, here are the consequences to that, and then add some slides or slide mm -hmm. from your survey to show the point. Yes. Okay. Sounds like we have a point. You could also put the slide up saying we want level services and then just pause see what happens. Yes, if they say, okay. Yes, exactly. <laughs> then we say, done. then we have a, like a, a slide that says, thank you, <laughs> questions. <laughs> Time for dinner. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. With that, where are we? Oh, oh Paul and Roby, we're on building and grounds. It's me. If I can also just add to this, too, and the meeting that we will have, or that you're going to be at, I'll be there too, around the Capitol. I included the Capitol Plan in the school committee oh, right. packet um, because one of the questions that we had was um, how does this fit into a larger Capitol Plan town-wide? Uh, we had another community meeting, and Paul can speak to this, about the um, fields project and what the implications of phasing would be. But I think, and I'll just let you speak to it, Linda, I think the school committee should probably determine what approach do, does the school committee want to continue to have a capital plan that sits over here that just the school committee is involved with or, or should this be integrated into a larger town framework and we have a timeline across the entire town and so i'll turn that over to you i don't know that i set it up all that well and of course building and grounds i'm sorry well you want to start with and then we can talk. We had a very helpful meeting. Uh, 
member from the public and then uh, a gentleman from Berkshire Design came and we talked about the, the full design and how we would phase that out. Uh, and it was very helpful to have both those folks there. And I think the next step was we were going to get um, it phased out. He delivered these today. Do you Excellent. want to pass them out? Sure. He deliver, oh hand delivered them to me today. I love when the cart is moved. Know, right? Hi, Hi everyone. <laughs> <laughs> So if you could take so one of each of these. And the idea is we're trying to break it into bite-sized pieces. The $1.3 oh, million the dollar oh. estimate of the Hopkins fields into something that's much more manageable. So we started with what's essential, we thought, from for a first phase. And uh, this is the first time I've seen this, too. We talked about whether how the uh, we could get some donations and community support into it and... and there's a lot of caution around those ideas. Uh, the donations, obviously, more easily done than actually having volunteer work. Um, some of this is pretty sophisticated stuff. And so um, I think we really parsed, uh, priced out the full contracting of it. So this is the gentleman from Berkshire Designs wanted to um, call him out that they were extremely helpful and they've done this just pro bono to help us out to understand how to do this work. So the proposal here is that you somehow look to secure funds for this first phase. In, which, is, just, in, so, which is this, in the green? Yes. Yeah. So it's the, it's the ag field now and revising part of the existing soccer field out there. One of the things we talked about is you can see there's an existing walk, or a, a walking path still added in to allow uh, full access for folks and then also, it would be uh, something the community could use as a walking path. That gives you a safe, a safe walking path to Hopkins, which you do not have now. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's nice. So we started with, and there's also timing here about phasing. There's extra it. copies. Do you guys want to look on? <clears throat> yeah, I can get them. I can get them. You got them. Too. So phasing when you do so a you certain field. just take one of each, and so I have an additional copy. One oh, sure. Yeah. Thank you. There's the new softball Thanks. field. The girls' softball field. There's a new baseball field, um, boys' varsity, and then a, uh, a hockey field or a hockey field, a soccer field. Hockey. <laughs> that was the next <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's right. Don't forget to tell That's you right. about the ring. There's the the high LI arena, and then there's the <laughs> horse racing. Um, So the idea would be to uh, start with this. That uh, serves a couple functions. Not only provides, um, uh, it, it works with the phasing, it uh, uses most of the land that's been purchased for us by the trustees of the IPO. One cost that isn't in here is the uh, the development of the bid specifications run 8% is what we should budget for, so an additional $35,000 roughly for phase one. So on any project, they suggested we budget roughly 8%. This, they were, as Paul pointed out, they were very generous. They did this pro bono. These obviously are not bid specs or final plans. That's the $35,000 that you need to pay for that. So would the first phase be to get the money for the bid specs? No, I think the first phase is what you see right here, and then if you for the bid specs would be yeah. to add an additional thirty-five thousand. You and Berkshire Design, Peter Wells from Berkshire Design, reinforced this. You really don't want to create bid specifications and go out to bid until you have the money in hand. So first phase would be all because you need to be able to point to the source. We're ready to go. You don't want to go out to bid when you're not ready. To bid. So some of the things you look at, you know, if it's a four hundred thirty-five thousand dollar cost. Um, 100 of that is the paved walkway. Mm -hmm. So This is paved, the walkway? Yeah, a portion of it is in phase yeah. one. You can see the little white line. The black dots would have to come in phase two. Um, but starting from Middle Street, there's kind of a white Yeah, but I mean line. like asphalt? You can plow it. Oh, thank you. Okay. And it's just more wheelchair accessible. Yep. We talked about yep. cedar yep. and chips. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Irrigation was something that was considered essential to get these fields up and running and, yep. and for maintenance. If you want a quality field, 
That's another high ticket item, 78,000. Well, I like phase one. It gets a lot of things done. It gets a lot done. It does. And so that that's a nice way to go. And the phasing works well. We talked about the timing where you'd still have playable fields playable while you're working fields. on yeah. it. Yeah. So, I, what, based on the conversation we just had, back in the day when we really did have more than a million dollars or close to a million dollars in the in the school choice account we paid for some of our own capital improvement projects which was widely um, criticized in town what which was criticized in town for well, using cash well yeah well that was criticized of course the fact I'm just that, saying. I, yes it was <laughs> criticized but i don't think at least it would be my strong feeling that we would not pay for capital projects with our school choice account because we need our school choice account for student services right. based on the conversation and budget presentation that we just had. Yeah. And so I feel like the field project as well as all of our capital projects really do need to be integrated into the town's capital mm -hmm. plan right. because we are one town. Yeah. And that and that I think that it would be good for us to go in, and we've basically done this with our year one, year two, year three, year four, we've mm -hmm. prioritized what we think is the most important. And now yeah. I think we have to bring this to the town and say, yes. we, we need your help yeah. in maintaining our schools and our grounds as part of the town's plan, and to bring this too, because yeah. We get asked all the time, when is the field project moving forward? And I think the field project is moving forward when the town wants the field project to move forward right. because we, the schools, don't have the money That's right. to do it. That's right. <coughs> Any more than we can afford to redo this girls' locker room spares. Exactly. Yep. I think that makes a lot of sense to, to, put, it, to put our capital plans. I think that's what the town has asked us to do. You have to, you know, they want it to they want to know what the capital needs are going forward. Yep. Um, but I don't I don't know and you might know this better because you were on the capital committee. I don't know really how much that's been integrated into the town's plans. Right. It has not. The school project. Right. I think from year to year, if we come forward and say we need a school bus or we need generators from year to year, that one request for that year has been considered and integrated into the plans. But there's never been an effort to kind of meld and prioritize and list as a whole. Mm -hmm. There's been discussion of it, but it, as far as I know, unless it occurred at meetings that I wasn't at, it has never occurred. So what would that look like if we if we put this forward and the town um, <coughs> said, wow, this is a great idea, so glad you got that phase one project dollar amount down. Is that a warrant this year? Is that what you... So the, the, it's explain to me how the capital committee works, because they don't propose anything for town meeting, correct? That still comes from the individual boards? How do they function? They get requests. They get requests. They, I think, re I'm trying to remember because it's been a long time now since. Do they get requests um, that are this big? Well, or do they you know, get the kind the of things tax you know, money that we put the, right. the town puts its the meals tax money into an informal pot of capital, right. and that's something like what three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Yes. So a project like this wouldn't be part of the meals tax money. So, right. right. So that usually the meals tax goes to a several smaller projects. Right. 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 Which would then indicate that if we want all of this in one fell swoop, then probably it would have to be a warrant article. So either a warrant article or perhaps even like, okay, we want to go for the full 300000 and we will have a fundraising campaign for the other 135000 and right. the community will match, you know, by raising. Or right. So the capital committee does not review those sorts of... No, they would. The, the town warrant. And they would make a recommendation. Okay. But, I'm just but wondering you're right, where you it go will come, it, will co it needs to come forward from someone. 
Right. And I think that's right. part of the discussion we need to have with the town. Right. Is how do we integrate and who puts forward and how, right. how is this process going to work? I think we have more than one stalled project, really, on our capital. You know, that we sort of put off, put off, that have we been stalled. or the town? The, or sc both. the schools. Both, yes. yes. The, well, both. But the schools. And so I think um, it would be good to get that, have that discussion and see if there can't be some sort of process created mm -hmm. to take care of it. Because I don't think, it, nothing's really happening in terms of big capital projects that we have talked about, oh, since I came onto school committee and that was a long time six, ago. seven years ago. Right. So, yeah. I, if I may, I do think that the town, various uh, boards, departments, select boards, even, and also based on the meeting that we went to where the select board, when I mean we, I'm referring to Roby, Paul, and I attended a meeting in which the select board asked every single department to stand up and talk about their capital needs. It was a public meeting, it was televised. It wasn't the most riveting meeting, so I'm not going to fault you for not choosing it as your viewing option that evening. But. Um, my impression was that the town is very interested, I, I don't mean to speak right. for the town, but my impression is that the town is very interested in saying, here are the capital projects across all departments, here are the various funding sources, here are the projects that are appropriate for X, Y, and Z funding source. Some funding sources are appropriate for certain right. kinds of projects like community right. preservation right. funds or meals tax funds. Here is, based on these capital requests, here is our townwide. Here are our townwide priorities, our townwide um, timeline, and yes, something could change in the event of an emergency. And then I would imagine the town would present to the taxpayers the opportunity to weigh in on that timeline and say, "Thank you so much, Jenny." Weigh in on that timeline. Wait and before she goes. Let's like between um, the last school committee meeting when you joined and this school committee meeting, you were accepted into UMass Commonwealth College and the Eisenberg School, which I would think is a cause and effect of joining the school. <laughs> so you're welcome for that. And congratulations. Thanks, Jenny. So, so that's the process. I get the impression that the town is very interested in that and. And that would be, certainly, I would speak individually, that would be, there would be a nice amount of clarity if that were to take place. Right. I don't yes. think that the school department, again, not trying to speak on behalf of the committee, I don't think the school department has any interest of placing something on a, on a warrant article and asking taxpayers to choose between, would you rather have an ambulance or would you rather right. have this? Clearly not. Um, right. No, there's no interest in that. So having a, a town-wide here's what we're hoping to do in this yep. order and here's why and taxpayer if you disagree weigh in <laughs> with your elected officials and I think that's the hope of the meeting at least starting with the school department and the capital planning community I believe a, a rep from capital planning will be there Mr. Devine and the town administrator Great. do you need anything from us in terms of a, a motion to like move this forward to the capital committee? Um, I think it's here, isn't it? Well, well they've already we've already given it to the town. Mm -hmm. They they request our capital uh, schedule, and we we give it to them every year. So they okay. so they <laughs> have disappears. already this million dollars. I believe so. Okay. They're and I guess the, I guess Humera, to answer your question is if I I don't know if you guys have done still agree that this is a prioritized list in terms of year two, three, four, five, or if that needs to be updated. And if you if that is a project for your committee or the whole committee. Well, so I, I wouldn't even say, we, had, we haven't even talked about how to prioritize what's on the list for next year, or this year, I would say, right. right? So if someone said fields or air conditioners, pick one. We haven't had that discussion. But, but I, I, I think it is true that we have them. I still agree that we have them listed for fiscal year 17 as a capital expense. But not prioritized. No. No. Well, those grease traps better get done because Mr. Waskevitz is not going to give us any more slack over that. Are the grease traps on this? Yeah. Yes, they are. Yes. 30,000. Oh, and then the okay. out years for the fields are to be determined, right? So we don't, yes. there's a, 
at well, least a second phase in there that we could. Would you have about one point three million dollars spread out over three fiscal years? No, I get yeah. it, but right. mm -hmm. I, those were ballparks. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Now we're building ballparks. <laughs> That's right. To go <laughs> well, with the horse uh, race. Yes, that is. The <laughs> Well, maybe at the next meeting we should have a, uh, a try to choose. Well, so what I don't understand is, are these, like you said, these maybe are not coming from the same pots, right? It may not. Right. So. But I think it's good to have a discussion with the town about where the, where the pots are. What the pots are, are and yes. where they are. And where and they think right. we should be, you know, have a discussion with them right. about where they should be accessed. Right. And perhaps after the meeting with a member of capital planning and the town administrator, um, it may be that at the March school committee meeting, the school committee needs to say, all right, in fiscal year 17, we have to say what is more important, air conditioning right. or phase one. Right. Or it could be that the town says, you actually don't have to make that decision because here are the sources of revenue that right. we right. have right. that we can apply yeah. to this. And exactly. We have no idea what other people are asking for. I don't. I shouldn't say we. I have no idea what other people are asking for, except for that one meeting. I didn't retain all of the asks that were presented at the meeting. And I'm uncertain as to what the revenue sources are. Right. Okay. Good. More to be done. Do we have anything else to do? Mm -hmm. uh, we do need to. CES met. No? They didn't. Well, okay. I, I didn't go. I'm sorry. I wasn't able to go. Sorry. So, so we the don't have only that. thing we have to do is make a declaration on the of library, library surplus. Oh. Again, another list that oh, everyone's she's been busy. Okay. I'll make a motion to accept the library surplus list as prepared. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. And before you close out, may I just say, because Brian just informed me, Mr. Beck just informed me, he was the recipient of the Jacob Ludes III Leadership Award for his contribution to the critical work of reforming the New England Association of Schools and Colleges public school accreditation process. Yay. So we're very proud of wow. him. Wow. Congratulations, Mr. Beck, on your yeah. award. Congratulations. All right. So our next meeting is March 28th, and the April meeting. I have it as March 21st. Why would I have that? Am I wrong? It's March 28th. I have it as March 28th, the fourth okay. Monday. March 21st is the third Monday. Okay. Which do you guys have? Whatever you have. Well, I got it from Annie, so I have the 21st. That's oh, really? The May, I just probably put it in my calendar the fourth Monday from the, now. No, the fourth Monday is the 28th. And I'm yeah. out of town on the 21st. All right. Well, okay. I apparently don't know what I'm talking about. I think the April meeting is April 25th, but we could have a debate about that in just a moment. So is when did you say March was? Vacation? I think it's March 28th. It is March 28th. I just don't know how to type. My apologies, Ruby. I really don't. It's even on my calendar. It's March 28th, but I don't know how to type. So it's March 28th. Um, is the 25th vacation week? I would assume vacation week is the 18th. The 18th, yeah. yeah. But I, I don't know. No, you're, yeah, you're correct in that. Um, April, March, so April April 25th is the April School yeah. Committee meeting. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. 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 March 20th at 5 o'clock or 5.30? 5.30. At this point in time, it would be 5.30 unless we require an executive session. Right. April 25th. Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't know. It's a little early, but I, I guess I'd take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Seconded. And go